Over the last little while, Katie and I have uh, remarked to each other that we have entered into a new and special phase in parenting, one that we've been waiting for for a long time. Uh, our oldest is now old enough to do some babysitting. And uh, boy, we didn't realize what we were missing beforehand. It's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. This is huge for us as parents. It's a, it's a whole new level of freedom for us. And so just as, just as with any sitter, there are a number of things that we run down uh, with her right before we leave the house. We're, we're about to be on our way out the door, and we don't want to miss anything important, so we give a bunch of important instructions right at the last minute. Your youngest brother goes to bed at 7.30. Don't answer the door. There's food in the fridge. We'll be home by 10. Make sure you turn off the oven when dinner is ready and call us if you need anything. They're not all related, but they're all important. They'll all help things run smoothly while we're gone. And this morning... The Apostle Paul is doing something kind of similar at the end of his first letter to the Thessalonian church. We're moving into the last few verses of this first letter to the Thessalonians. We're going to finish out the letter this morning and next week. It's as if Paul is on his way out the door and he's rattling off the last few important things before he goes. They're not all directly related to each other, but they're all important. Here's how the household should run while I'm gone. Here's how the church should live and should operate in the meantime. Here's what a peaceful church that lives in accordance with the gospel it believes looks like. So as we, as we go through this uh, section that we're looking at this morning, verses 12 through 22 in chapter 5, they're not all going to be directly related to each other. There will be sort of a, a hodgepodge of things that we're going to talk about this morning, but that's okay. They're all given to the Thessalonian church and through them to us as instructions from the Lord on what a, a smooth, peaceable, gospel-believing, God-honoring church looks like, okay? So let's read it. 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to read verses 12 through 22. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to your word this morning, longing to hear you speak, and knowing that as you, as you needed to give these instructions to some of our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago, that just as, just as they needed to hear it, so do we. It seems that the, th the, the same things that cause uh, trouble among us down through the ages, remain true of us now. So we pray, open up our hearts to hear. 
and spirit through the word that you inspired. Speak God's truth to us. Make us open, humble, and receptive to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first, uh, a few things about, about leaders and the church. A few things about leaders in the church. Verses uh, 12 and 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't name them specifically, but here he is talking about those who labor among you and are, and are over you in the Lord. He's talking about people who, who have a certain amount of spiritual responsibility and authority in the church. Elsewhere, these people are, are referred to as elders, as those who are, who are given spiritual charge in a church. Okay? And so here, they are described as those who... Basically, three ways that they're described as those who labor among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. And, and the people are told to two things, to respect them and to esteem them very highly in love. Okay? So, a few things. The elders are, are told to, uh, are referred to as those who labor among you. That is, that they're expected to apply themselves to their work as under-shepherds of Jesus. It is, it is labor. It is work. It's not just a title that you receive and then sort of, you know, sit back and do nothing with. It, it, it requires work from those who are called to the work. It requires the time to be put in to, to, to learn the scriptures and to teach them, to get to know the people and to speak that truth into their lives to spend a good deal of time praying for those who are, uh, for those that, that you are responsible for. It is labor, it is work, and it will cost you something. Okay. They're also described as those who are over you in the Lord. They are, they are expected to lead well. Uh, the, the, the word here that's, uh, that's, that's described both in terms of uh, labor and of being over them in the Lord, the word is, is particularly used of those in positions of authority who are expected to care for those in their charge, like doctors or, or like parents, okay? And so the expectation is not only that they will have authority and maybe wield their authority with a, you know, an iron fist or something like that will, will you know, demand respect and, and all of that, but that they will take the necessary care to look out for the best interests of those in their, in their spiritual charge, to have an interest in them, to invest themselves in their well-being. And it says that they're supposed to Admonish, that is to encourage in doing good and to warn against sin. And it's, this is something I reflect on a little bit um, now and again. It's interesting to me sometimes who churches or who we as, as people in our churches expect their leaders to, to admonish. This is a conversation I've had a few times over the last several years that often, and sometimes it's because of churches that we grew up in or sort of the, the Christian subculture that we happened to inhabit when we, were, uh, when we were being discipled in maybe in the early days of our faith, but often we come with an expectation that the main objects of admonition when we gather in a church are going to be forces outside the church. They want the church's admonition to be trained on Hollywood culture or the government or feminism or the LGBTQ lobby or, or some other force that they're worried is going to infiltrate your lives and undermine your faith. 
that the great threats that you experience and the things that need to be rebuked and warned against all the times are the things that are out there and we want to keep it from finding its way in here. But make no mistake, the single greatest threat to your faith in Christ Jesus is not coming from out there. The single greatest threat to your faith in Christ lives within you. It lives within me. It's our own sinful desires, our own pride, our own self-righteousness, or our own indifference, our own refusal to die to ourselves and to learn to love God and others. Those are the things that will undermine us. So faithful leaders will admonish you. They won't focus their energies on perceived threats from without, but on the common enemy within. And it means we all need to come here wanting to be encouraged and admonished on the things within us. Teaching, it means that when we are taught or when we hear When we hear a sermon, we want the person who is teaching or the person who is preaching to be speaking to the people sitting here, not the people out there somewhere. It means we all need to come wanting to be encouraged and admonished on the things within us. Sermons or teachings that are only about how wicked external groups are or how to stay away from them Only harden us in the publican's prayer. Lord, thank you that I'm not like other men. Okay. The leaders in the church are described as those who labor among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. And the people are expected to respect them and to esteem them highly in love. This doesn't mean that One can never uh, disagree with anyone who holds one of those positions in the church. It definitely does not mean that. We are human, and we can be wrong. But he is describing the way that things are supposed to work, the way that things are supposed to look. Those who are charged with the spiritual care of Christians are meant to labor at it, give themselves to it, care for the people under their charge, and to admonish them wisely. And the people are supposed to, for the sake of what they are doing, respect them and esteem them highly in love. This combination of leadership and affection are meant to create peace, he says in the church. Be at peace among yourselves. Okay, so that's sort of the first first part of the hodgepodge, leaders and the church. Second part, our relationships with each other, verses 14 and 15. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Okay, I want us to notice something here. We have uh, the people that are being... Uh, the people that are being addressed repeated twice in the first few verses of this passage here. Verse 12 starts, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, so on and so forth. So the, the first brothers makes it clear that the brethren that he's talking about are the brothers and sisters in the church, everyone in the church, because we're meant to, meant to respect and esteem very highly and love all those who labor among you, so on and so forth. He's addressing the whole church. And then he comes back again, and again in verse 14 he says, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. And I mention this because when you hear those things, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, all those things, it sounds like maybe the sorts of things that we might expect only those who are in those positions of authority to do, but that's not who he's addressing. He is again 
talking to everyone. He's talking to the whole church as a collective, the brothers and sisters in, in, the, uh, in the community, okay? And he's saying, all of these things that I'm about to say all refer to you. These instructions to admonish, to encourage, and to help aren't just for the leaders of the church. They're for everyone. They're for everyone. And so he talks about different people inside the congregation who are going to need different kinds of attention. They have different needs. He says, to the idle to, or to the disorderly or to the undisciplined, you admonish them. With the faint-hearted, you encourage them. And the weak, you help. And then he says, be patient with all of them and make sure no one returns evil for evil. So let's talk just a little bit about those three things. He says to admonish the idle. Remember, as we've been going through uh, this letter that we talked about how there's sort of this there's, this, there's this imminent expectation that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to be here any minute now. We know that he ascended to heaven. We know that he's coming back the way that he went. And so it's coming any second now, any minute. Maybe it's not today. Maybe it's not tomorrow, but very, very soon. We're not talking years. Maybe we're talking months until Jesus comes back. And so because of that expectation, they had given up on a lot of their sort of daily responsibilities. They had walked away from their work, for instance, and were relying simply on the, on the charity and kindness of other Christians to live, to eat. Not because they were unable to work, but just because they had chosen not to. Okay? And so Paul says, those who are idle in this way, those who have given up on that stuff, those who have stopped working, those who, are, those who are undisciplined, who've given up on their responsibilities, he says, admonish them. Warn them about the seriousness of what they're doing. Remind them about their responsibilities. Tell them what it is that they're supposed to do. They should be shown their fault and then warned of its consequences. If you won't work, if you refuse to work, even though you can, you likely won't eat. Get back to your job. And then he talks about the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted are those who were, who were timid in their faith. Who were afraid to, to live it in any sort of way that might cost them something. Perhaps they were consumed by some anxiety or, or afraid because of the persecution that had started in the, in the earliest days of the church. Paul says they're to be encouraged, reinforced in what they're doing well, reminded of who they are and what they have in Jesus Christ, reminded of the good that comes from living according to their convictions. So he takes a different tack with those, who are, with those who are afraid, with those who are worried, with those who are timid. With those who brazenly walked away from their responsibilities, he says, you, you, you admonish them. You be very direct with them. With those who are timid, he says, you be encouraging. Remind them of the good that they have and that they can do through Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the weak. It's hard to know exactly what he's talking about. The great Anglican pastor, John Stott, suggested that the weak should be understood as referring to those caught in the grips of, of some sin. Those who are weak in their fight against their, their, their flesh. And so he says, for those in such a situation, you should help them. Come to their aid in their fight against, against whatever the thing is that they're, that they're struggling with. A literal rendering of the verb would paint a picture of something like hold on to them or cling to them or even, even put your arm around them, something, something like that. Help them, enter into the struggle with them. Offer your prayer, offer your support. 
Offer tangible ways that you can help them in the fight. Make obedience seem plausible, seem possible, seem beautiful to them. And notice something about all this stuff that Paul says here, these different situations, different, different things that are going on with people that need addressing. And depending on the circumstances of what's going on, Paul calls for different responses to it. A lot of us, whether we've, whether we've heard the... Na- okay, all right, let me say this first. That often, I expect that there's something of this in just about every Christian tradition. But, but, but in ours, in sort of the Reformed and Presbyterian world, I think... I think the idea has come across over time that just about, just about every problem can be fixed with admonition. That, that warning or challenging people is the right response to everything that, that might come up in our lives. Every place where we aren't exactly following Christ or every place where we're caught in some sin. And, okay, so for, for about 40 years now, there's been, uh, there's been a... Uh, a, a, a movement within Christian counseling that's sort of particular to our corner of it, and it's sometimes called neuthetic counseling. And if you don't know that name, that's okay. Uh, but the, the name neuthetic comes from the Greek verb neutheteo. It's, it's, it's the verb that's translated admonish here. It means to admonish someone, to exhort them, to warn them, okay? And from from some of the very earliest days, it's gotten a lot better as it's gone throughout the years, but some of the very earliest stuff in that, in that movement sought to treat every situation as though what was needed was admonition. So that the approach would rewrite the passage that we just read to go something like this. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers... Admonish the idle, admonish the faint-hearted, admonish the weak. See what I'm saying? But the needs of each, of each situation, the needs of each person, they, they differ depending on what's, on what's going on. Some do need admonition. Some people need encouragement. Some people need to be reminded of the things that they are doing well, of the places where God is is pleased with them and to be encouraged to keep on in the places where they're already showing faithfulness. Some people need help. They're already aware of their guilt. They're already aware of the ways in which they're failing. They don't need another admonition to be told about it again. They need someone to come alongside and to offer some practical, tangible help in heading in the right direction. So in every situation, whether in admonition or encouragement or help, Paul says that patience is to be afforded everyone. Here's the thing. I remember, okay, there's like an an inverse correlation between, between how much patience you need, how patient people need to be with you, and the amount of patience that you are willing to show other people. You know what I mean? Like, I can remember, I can remember when, I was, when I was a good deal younger, when I was maybe in my late teens, early, early to mid-twenties, that um, God had been very, very patient with me. Okay? God is patient with all of us every day. And there are points in our lives where, we are, where we're particularly immature where we're just started, you know, getting to getting to, we're, we're just sort of getting going in our discipleship. And we have we have a lot of sins that, that we, we we don't even know are there. We don't even know that they are sins, and yet God is patient with us, and he he shows them to us as we're ready to see them and to turn from them and and repent from them. But when we're But when we're, it's not always when we're young, but it's often when we're young, 
we get really excited, we get, we get, we get our hooks into something, we find, we find something, maybe even something theological that really connects with us, that we're very excited about, and we have zero patience for everybody else. I just discovered this thing, and it's amazing, and what are you guys doing that you're not on the same page as me right now? What is going on with you? Or I just stopped doing that sin last week, even though it had been going on for years. How is it that you're not stopping right now, you guys out there? Come on. We need to remember, we need to remember how patient God has been with all of us. That every single person deals with, deals with indwelling sin, has those, has those particular things that sort of nip at our heels throughout throughout much of our lives, and, and, and we often see growth and, and mortification of those things over time, and yet, and yet often the, the temptation is still kind of there in the background. God is patient with us, shows us the things that we need to see when the moment is right, when the time is right, which means that we need to do the same with others. We know We know what it's like to be blind to things that are going on in our own lives, to struggle to say no to things that 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 are bad for us, and yet we've just we've gotten into the habit of saying yes to over years and years and years. God is patient with us in those things, so we must be patient with each other. And lastly, he says that no one should repay evil for evil. This is the only way that the church is a peaceable place. Otherwise, we'll be caught in the same cycles that we see going on in the world all around us of wrong, grievance, outrage, punishment. Wrong, grievance, outrage, punishment that never stops. When we refuse to return one wrong with another, when we learn to turn the other cheek, when we learn to forgive and not to repay, then the wrongs stop. The cycle stops with the one that's done to us. We're heading into a time in the next few months where we're going to be together again regularly. It's great, right? And we're coming out of a really tough last 16 months, whatever it is, and I expect a lot of us have, have experienced things that, that, that we perceive as wrongs, maybe that are wrongs, over that time. People who haven't cared for us the way that they ought, people who have been sharp or, or judgmental with us. We can carry all of that back here and try to make sure that we get back at them in some way. That we make sure that they answer for the slights that we've perceived over that time. But I'll tell you, if we do that, it's going to be miserable. Really miserable. If there are things that need addressing, fine, do it. But sit down with the person with an eye to reconciliation. as we get back together over these, over these coming weeks and months. Let's do it in such a way where we are not trying to hold on to the things that have made us angry or bitter or resentful over the prior months, but where we are committed not to repaying wrong for wrong. It will make it I promise it'll make it a joyous reunion over these coming months. All right. Last thing, just sort of a few things at the end. Again, I promised it was a hodgepodge. Our priorities, look at verses 16 through 22. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, 
Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. He talks about, uh, about worship and prayer in 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And he says these things, he says rejoice always, and he says pray in all circumstances. Sometimes, sometimes we've taken instructions like that to mean that you should find, that you should be happy about everything that happens to you, since he says rejoice always. Or that you should give thanks for everything that, 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 that comes about in life, because he says uh, give thanks in all circumstances. But that's not exactly what Paul's saying here. He says we rejoice always but not that we rejoice in all things. He says that we make prayer a habit of life. He says that we give thanks in all circumstances, but not for all circumstances. What he's saying is that the object of our rejoicing and of our prayers and of our thanksgiving is Jesus Christ himself, not our circumstances. So if if you are going through the most difficult or grievous part of your life, It's not that you are meant to be happy as that happens, but rather that you can know with joy, you can know that you have Jesus Christ and that you are His, that you belong to Him and are found in Him no matter what else is going on out there. Okay, The object of our rejoicing and of our prayers and of our thanksgiving is always Jesus Himself. He says to honor the word of God. It sounds like maybe that's not what he's talking about, but it is as he talks about uh, prophecies. Verses 19 through 21, he says, don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Prophecies continued through the, at least through the first generation of the church. They had some of the scriptures, they had some of the New Testament, they had all of the Old Testament, but the New Testament wasn't complete yet. God hadn't completed his revelation to his people yet. So the Lord taught his people both through what both through his written word and through prophecies. But not all who claimed to prophesy actually were. And so Paul says, you need to test everything that is said. Everything that claims to be a prophecy, go back and test it against the written word, which we know comes from the Lord, and test it against everything that you know about the Lord Jesus Christ from what what has been told you. He says, hold fast to what is good. And so they accepted what was genuine and rejected what wasn't. But notice that similar instructions aren't given about the scriptures. They're only given about the prophecies. He doesn't go and say, search the scriptures and hold fast to what is true, but reject what isn't. Because God always speaks to us truly through His His word. And so these instructions given to the believers in Thessalonica in that first generation of Christians in the church, these instructions were meant to instill in people the expectation that they are to receive and believe everything that genuinely comes from the Lord. So our modern application would be to honor the word of God, to live according to the scriptures and to believe and to know that every time we read them, that God speaks to us truly and we ought to hold fast to it. And lastly, he says, flee from sin, from every form of sin in verse 22. Sometimes this verse has been taken to mean something like, Flee, or sometimes it's been translated to say, flee every appearance of evil. And that causes an awful lot of confusion. Some people have taken it to mean anything that might appear evil to anyone, you must not do. Essentially, it makes everything sinful that anyone anywhere might perceive as wrong. If it appears to someone else that it's wrong, then it is wrong and you can't do it. You need to to flee from it. But that's 
nuts. That would, that would make Jesus into a sinner. It would, mean, it would mean, taken to its logical conclusion, that our morality is set by the most anxious, the most sensitive, and the most strict people in the world. But that's not what the verse means. It doesn't mean flee from whatever anyone else thinks appears evil. It means flee from evil in every way that it appears. Flee from every instance of evil. Flee from every form of evil. Flee from sin no matter what way it shows up. Because sometimes it's obvious. There's a big temptation in a moment to cheat on your spouse or to lie and to cheat on your taxes or to steal something from the store or whatever it is. But sometimes it's far more subtle. The internal monologue about how you deserve better than your current situation or your current spouse that turns into resentment and bitterness over time. The urge to criticize others at work to make you appear smarter or more efficient. The pull to prove that you're one of the cool kids at school by putting others down or by ignoring them. So Paul says, flee sin in whatever form it comes. The really obvious ones. The subtle ones too. Here's the thing. Here's how we're going to bring it all together. Jesus died for every believer, each and every one of you who believes in him, and he brought us all together inside his church. He didn't do it so that we could bicker or ignore each other. He did it so we could learn to love and serve people who are different from us. Church would look an awful lot different if we just got to choose who was in it if it was only our best friends or only those who are exactly like us. But but God has people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, every background, every personality. And so he takes all of them and he throws us together. And he says, this is what you need in order to learn how to love me and each other. He did it so that his new humanity could learn to live in peace. So here's, here's how it's done. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will help us to respect and to esteem very highly those who are over us in the Lord. That those with such responsibility might labor at their work, might seek to lead as those who are charged with caring for those who are their responsibility. We pray that you will help us to love each other well, to admonish when it's needed, to encourage when it's needed to help when it's needed, to live at peace with each other and to be patient with each other. And help us to worship, to rejoice, to pray, to offer thanksgiving because of Jesus Christ in every circumstance that we have him No matter what happens around us, if our life is going exactly the way that we planned or exactly the opposite, that we would honor your word, hold fast to it as true, flee from sin. Lord, make us a peaceable, patient, faithful, people, because Jesus died for each and every one, made us his own, and brought us together. Let this be a place that reflects him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.